a series of brief presentations from each of the members of the panel, uh, accompanied by slides, to illustrate some of the core points of what we're talking about. And then we'll be going into a, a more of a discussion stage, more like a, hopefully, a, a, an interesting conversation. And we'll be opening up to questions as well. So uh, as the evening progresses, um, well, it could get better and better. I'm going to start off with a, a slightly, well, arguably a, a rather negative view of things. I, I think we're in deep trouble and we've got to do a lot to get ourselves out of it. It's been suggested that we act as if or with the strength of a force of nature now. Um, I'm inclined to believe that's true. We're living on this little bundle of rock and stuff in the middle of space and we speculate a little sometimes. What, what if an asteroid were to hit us? What would happen? What would be the consequences of that devastating thing coming from the sky? And we get the, the scenarios of things like extreme storms and events sweeping across the world. We get the visions of raging fires across the planet happening where they never happened before, roaming out of control. Uh, specter of rising sea levels as the ice is melted by after the impact of the asteroid, the loss of food production that comes with the rising sea levels, the pollution in the atmosphere and all the rest of it, and of course necessarily as a consequence of all that, starvation, pestilence and disease. I hope you've got a drink already. And species extinction, big time. Thousands of them disappearing in the blink of the geological eye. It's the same kind of consequence that you get from rapid climate change. And I believe we're in that process now. A lot of people do say that. And that there are consequences for how we should be building and how we should be making our cities. So we may speculate about an asteroid hitting us one day and having all of these rather awful impacts on our planet, I would argue that those impacts are already taking place and that we are the asteroid. <laughs> Emphasis on the S. <laughs> <laughs> so that's to uh, give a little bit of background. Because of that, because things are so critical, then if we cannot absolutely stop this a series of negative events from happening, we can start to turn things around. And in fact, the evening is actually going to be devoted to positives and what we can do about all of this. But underlying all of this is a great sense of urgency. And the idea that if we are going to survive, we are going to need perhaps to adapt, and we'll talk some more about that later, and we'll need to build total environments that both connect to the flux of the biosphere, which keeps us all going in the first place, and provide controlled conditions to make our lives bearable. That's on the basis that when we've made buildings, when we've created architecture, it's because we have wanted to make conditions a little more comfortable than raw nature would provide us with. We put a bit of shade over our heads and so forth um, to stop cooking in the sun. We, we put roofs to keep the rain off. We manipulate the climate at that level now that we've got such a massive society, increasing populations, and rapid change, we're going to have to learn to do that, perhaps in more collective ways. And that is where um, perhaps we can talk later about the connection between trying to do things in an individual way, with individual sustainable houses, and many of you will have been out and looked at sustainable houses uh, last weekend, and, and whether that's enough, or, and how much we may need to connect to the bigger picture of the urban ecosystem in order for all of this to actually make a real difference. The other thing is, and the one thing that I think gets under, underplayed, as it were, in all these discussions, is we're going to have to grow more food because we're getting more people whether we want it or not, and we're going to have less and less land to do that on all the time. In Australia, uh, we're losing land to uh, all sorts of reasons but not least urban development. But we can't afford to carry on like that and we'll hear about ways to tackle those sorts of issues. 
So that for me is the, the picture, the big picture. And what it says is that we've been accidentally messing around with a living system which is the size of a planet. Now we have to mess with that on purpose. We have to have a purpose about the way we deal with life on this earth. And we're going to work it through the way we build. So how can we do that? What, 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 are, what are the solutions out there? What are the, the ways we might actually do something positive? We're going to hear from uh, our speakers here. The first, uh, I'd like to introduce Marcy Webster-Manison. Uh, Marcy commenced her architectural career in 1979. After three decades working in architectural practice in Noosa Head, Sydney, Canberra, regional New South Wales and Brisbane, Marcy joined the University of Queensland in 2008 and is the director of the University Centre for Sustainable Design. Marcy is known for state-of-the-art, ecologically inspired architecture as a practicing architect, speaker and writer. Amongst over 20 state, national and international awards for architecture, Marcy received a special jury award from the RIAA, RAIA excuse, for her contribution to the advancement of architecture and commitment to environmentally sensitive design in 2001. And Marcy isn't just a, a theorist. As campus director of design, when at the Thurguna campus of Charles Sturt University in New South Wales, Marcy led a design team that brought together rammed earth and passive design with active technologies and advanced computer controlled environments to create an iconic and much awarded dynamic model, quote, for sustainable community living that aims to address some of Australia's major environmental concerns, such as habitat loss for native plants and animals, limited water resources, and increased energy use. Marcy is currently director of the Centre for Sustainable Design at the School of Architecture in the University of Queensland. Marcy. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, look, I, I want to talk about um, what we can learn from the past that can inform our um, future habitation of this planet. Um, we don't really know what the, the future is, is going to bring, but it looks like we're heading fairly fast into a um, not utopian vision of the future, but um, perhaps more a sci-fi nightmare. Uh, and where we've come from is, is something, you know, relatively benign existence on this planet until recently. So um, I've been, uh, as Paul mentioned, an architect for 30 years, building buildings and trying to make them more sustainable. And I guess um, started to question myself, you know, how, how can this make a difference? It certainly can't make a difference fast enough. Um, it, it only makes a very small little impact for those people that are using it. It, it makes no overall difference. Um, I don't have control of this. Where am I? Just there. Okay. Just show me when you need yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I started uh, to think that I, wa I wanted to move into um, a larger um, view of things, a wider view of things than, than what um, commercial practice certainly will, uh, will allow because you, we go from project to project to project uh, um, and do what your client wants. Uh, and to me, that um, it's more important to be looking um, wider field. So, so I, I've started this project of, of looking at neighbourhoods and how they're defined, trying to use natural systems like um, hills and creeks to, to, um, to define a neighbourhood as a unit that maybe co could ev um, develop as a more ecologically sound place to live. Uh, and, and that work um, is looking at a lot of different ways of mapping our environment, sort of physically, socially, environmentally, and then, and then trying to sort of look at all those layers um, and, and through, through that um, try to understand some of the complexities and, and work out um, a gentler way of, of um, living in, in communities, in cities. So a particular area that I'm studying is uh, the catchment of Western Creek, which is overlapping about five different suburbs in inner, inner city Brisbane. 
has a population of um, 12,000 people. Uh, but adjacent this, in one small corner of it, is planned to double that population. It's through 20 and 30 storey high rises, what Brisbane's calling transit orientated development. And that's how we're increasing our residential um, capacity to take the population increases that you probably read about um, that Queensland is experiencing. Uh, I'm trying to look at an alternative to this. So um, in examining, for example, and this is just a real snapshot, um, looking at landscape, how it could connect up this suburb, and then what does that mean? Well, it means a lot, actually. We start to get food production areas. We, we um, if you introduce creeks, reintroduce creeks, which have all been buried in this suburb, so when I say the Western Creek catchment, the Western Creek no longer exists. It's been piped. So if you reintroduce creeks as your infrastructure, what they originally did do for our um, towns was to provide the stormwater drainage. So we could recreate that sort of um, thing and it has lots of ecological benefits. Um, it, it, la changing the landscape allows us to food production areas, it cools the surrounds, has so many benefits. In terms of um, water, uh, for example, in studying this area, uh, we worked out that yes, we could actually supply this area with all of its water needs simply through local collection. Um, and we could treat all of its excess water within the catchment. So it is possible um, to rehabilitate our suburbs. I, I wanted to establish, well, is it actually viable or have we gone too far? Is there too much concrete and too much overdevelopment? Well, in this typical Brisbane inner city suburb, there's, there's not, it's we're, we're, we're demonstrating. Another thing we've looked at is um, energy. So if we took 10% of the existing <coughs> roof area, and 10%'s rather arbitrary, we think that we should be able to find 10% of the existing roof area um, with a good orientation for solar collection. Uh, and that if we could have 10% of the roof area, we could generate all the electricity this suburb needs in the future. So this is starting to look pretty positive. Um, waste. Why do we truck our waste all over the countryside? Pick it up. Huge. We talk about food miles and food, you know, if we're going to make any difference in, on to the planet, if we could simply deal with food from what I've um, read, that would make the biggest impact, you know, um, of anything, of all the other measures combined. So even if we walked to work and had solar collection and water tanks and everything we could do as an individual, um, growing our own food would actually make a, um, a bigger impact than all those other things combined. So, so food is absolutely critical. and and linked to that, of course, is waste. So 60% of our waste approximately in, in this, um, according to Bureau of Statistics, is um, organic. So w immediately we could be composting a significant proportion of our waste locally. And then that little red dot that you see there, that's the area of landfill that we would need for the rest of our waste for this particular local area. So we could even deal with that on a local level. We don't have to have our waste moved out of the city to the edge of the city and then into a dump and then have all the problems that we've got with it. So um, I know my time, my time is up, but I just wanted um, to give a, a picture, I suppose, of a possible future with the infrastructure that, that we've got going a next stage instead of always thinking that we have to go build new um, and in the and and uh, as I said, I'm looking to the past. Um, this can only happen if people want to change. It, you, it doesn't matter. I, I've been I, I know this from any number of experiences. Uh, buildings are not going to change how people behave. They can facilitate change behaviour, but they're not going to change the behaviour. So so on the social side, what I'm working on is is looking at people's um, remembered history. 
as well as environmental history, um, what is peop what's important to people. And it's giving me a surprising new faith in people because um, every workshop that I've run, it comes down to about 99% of the people. Um, what's most important to them, whether you ask them when they were growing up, whether uh, now, any, uh, ask in lots of different ways. What's most important comes back to nature. Um, ask them what their best memory of childhood was. 99% of people, it'll be something that happened outside. It won't be inside. So, so the, our connection is still there. Our connection with nature is still there. We just don't seem to have realised that we have to look after it um, to maintain that connection. Uh, so as I said, this is a work in progress, but I do have confidence the project that Paul w referred to that um, where I've won most of the architectural awards um, for my work is um, where um, 10 years of um, buildings and campus planning that I did for Charles Sturt University at their campus at Kaduna. And, and it showed that um, where we've got a total um, water sy management system, for example, we're using 5% potable water five percent of what um, the other campuses are using. Um, we're using um, 35 percent of the power. So, so uh, and, and then what people, the, the best thing about the whole campus though is what people say about it, um, about how they, they feel being there, how they love working on building it because it was um, a real thing to build, it wasn't prefab trusses, and that they love um, working in the buildings because they smell so good and um, feel comfortable and, 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 and look e actually even look good. Um, so, so I do have, um, in that sense, a positive out outlook that, that it is possible to, to do these things, but as I, I keep coming back to, um, it really depends on our change of behaviour not anything that I as an architect or as an urban designer or a sustainability consultant can do. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Uh, it's like despite everything, you've, you've regained a faith in people.